room. This is actually the discussion on individualized treatment, okay? And um, for just to get started, we're actually going to be using the interactive uh, app for some voting. And if you want, you can um, put your questions forward that way. So if you all have your app on you, you can on individualized take them out now. treatment. You need okay. to open your app. And, um, for you need to be just sure to get that started, it's updated. We're actually going so to allow be using it to the update. interactive <laughs> then uh, the app fastest way for is some to voting. go to sessions now. Pick our session, and you'll see the front page um, in the first blue line. The uh, second app thing on that some blue voting. line says vote. And if you want, you can. Um, put your questions okay, this forward is new, that way. So, so if you I all have your app right. on you, right and on individualized now, treatment, you need to okay. open and your app. And, um, um, for you need just to be sure to the start at the moment. So to allow it to update. Update. We're coming here for a pro-con debate about individualized treatment and access to that as a programmatic issue. That's not actually what you're going to hear, because in fact, um, we all agree from our discussions last week, and I think that um, all of the audience would agree that that actually is not a pro-con debate anymore. And that in fact, what we want to talk about today is what does an individualized regimen look like and how do we get there? Okay. With that discussion, we're going to make one assumption that you'll hear in some of the questions that we're going to pose to each other. And that is that whole genome sequencing is probably a necessary construct to programmatic individualized treatment regimens. Okay, so that's the basis here. Let me introduce our panel um, from, I'm gonna go from far to near. Um, Jennifer Furin, Carol Mitnick, Nazir Ismail, Thada Mozidi. Carol and Jennifer are actually from the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard in Boston in the United States. Nazir is from the Center for TB and WHO TB Supranational Lab in South Africa. Thado, I think many of you will recognize from other um, union conferences, is a physician, XDR survivor, and activist from South Africa. So let's begin here. And everyone, please feel free to grab the microphone whenever you want. But um, what should the initial treatment regimen be? Empiric versus individualized? Should it be after a rapid diagnostic, such as expert, or only when you know whole genome sequencing results? And does the epidemiology of the country assist with this question? We can take whichever one you'd like to start out with. I think um, Jennifer and Carol, you actually volunteered that you would be ready for that question, so I'm putting you on the spot. Great. Thank you so much, Jane, and um, I'm really looking forward to talking with these esteemed panelists uh, and sharing the discussion with all of you. Um, but before I answer the question, um, officially our title of this session has been changed to Let's Be Ambitious. Um, because I think we need a little bit more ambition about the way that we approach uh, the diagnosis and treatment of drug-resistant TB. Uh, we know there are a lot of exciting new diagnostic methods, and I know Nazir could talk about those in detail. Um, but we do know that many of the methods that give us more detailed drug susceptibility testing can take quite a while uh, for the results to come back. Uh, there are always situations where we don't get the results back even uh, despite our best efforts. And so we really need a very strong empiric initial regimen to start patients on because up front, we don't usually have more information now than just rifampicin resistance. So in TB, we're used to starting weak and then adding later, and that paradigm needs to be turned on its head where we start strong with a clear empiric regimen while we're awaiting the rest of the, the more informed DST that we get back. So I think we need both, and I think that uh, particularly while we're waiting for DST results that are more detailed, uh, we need a strong empiric regimen. Thanks, Jennifer. I, the only thing I would add to that is that I, I, to have a strong regimen, that means using all of the available information. And that may be a rapid DST, that may be information about a household contact, that may include information about the local epidemiology of disease. And all of that information needs to be incorporated 
with the ultimate goal, as Jen suggested, being a stronger regimen that could be weakened with more information becoming available. But the risks of starting weak and adding are obviously additional ampl amplification of resistance or continued transmission. Um, and those are really consequences to be avoided at all costs. Maybe I could just add in there. I think the, the issue around the epidemiology is probably important. I mean, if you look at South Africa, where rifampicin prevalence rate is about 5%, meaning that 95% should be rifampicin susceptible. And usually your co resistance is fairly low. Um, and your first line regimen is fairly effective. But I mean, if you look at Eastern Europe, the MDR rates among TB cases is quite high. So I think the epidemiology would make a, a huge difference in deciding whether you'd want um, comprehensive DSTs up front or not. I think practically when looking at whole genome sequencing, we're not necessarily there for direct testing and hitting hard and hitting early um, within a strong empiric regimen makes the most sense. So like that's kind of the approach we've taken for South Africa. But, but you're right, I mean, undetected resistance could lead to amplification. Uh, but the big question is really around, again, the epidemiology. What's your, if you're using new drugs versus the old drugs, if you're using old drugs, obviously there's a lot of co-resistance, and having an individualized kind of therapy is very important. Uh, but if you're using all the new drugs, your co-resistances are fairly low. Uh, and again, it's the epi epidemiology of your environment and the time period in which you, you're applying these. It's, um, it's actually, I'm curious to have this conversation with my colleagues <laughs> here, um, which is, how local, though, do we get with the epidemiology? Because even in a country like South Africa, where it's generally 5% rifampicin resistant, if you go to some settings like among mine workers or you know uh, other settings where there's a high rate of HIV co-infection, that epidemiology actually changes. So how do we take those things into account? Let me, if I may comment, I think the, the one thing that's a very important predictor for drug resistant TB is prior exposure to drugs. So if you've had prior exposure to certain agents, your likelihood of resistance is much higher. So even if you've been previously exposed to Vodacron or Clofaz, again, that'll inform. So, so I think that's at a patient level. Uh, the question of the heterogeneity, I think it, it doesn't just apply to drug resistant TB, it applies to all, right? Uh, because there's vast differences. If I look at two different cities in South Africa, even within a city, uh, and again, it's, it's, the, it's the whole issue of how you perceive a patient. Do you just ask for symptoms and look at the lab result and treat? Or do you look at their prior exposure, their drug histories, uh, you know, the social environment in which they've come from, the location they've come from, uh, alcohol abuse, drug levels? So that's, I think, the whole point around the individualization versus uh, the empiric regimen as well. All right. I'm going to uh, do one thing. I forgot. I gave that great talk about the polling, and I forgot to put up the first poll. While we're, while we're talking, because it's about this to see if the audience is in the same type of an agreement. So y'all start putting in your answers to this to see what you think. And I wanted to actually bring this back still to that question one second and I'll bring in. Um, are there situations or are there countries where in fact an empiric therapy should never be started? That we should be waiting if, let's say we have the perfect lab scenario where we're going to have whole genome sequencing or some type of advanced um, therapy, is there ever a time where one should wait? I'd say, I mean, so I see the question is about the ideal world, right? So if we had a um, whole genome sequencing uh, result that could be available in a day um, or even less than a day, you know, and you'd have it before the patient leaves the clinic and you have that profile, uh, then it makes no, I mean, that's the time point where you really need to individualize. Because I think, you know, we use these broad range empiric regimens, but the counterbalance is also that you have a risk for adverse events with these drugs. So they're not all easy. So I mean, if you look at Linizla, they might be low resistance, but the adverse event profile is quite steep. So again, the issue is if you have, uh, if you're able to have a very, uh, comprehensive picture of a patient, I'd say that would be the time where you should not be giving empiric treatment, but rather individualized based on how soon and how accurate that result can be made available. 
I don't know if others have come in. And Beto, I, I think you'd like to get yes, in here. Yes, and maybe if I could just throw a, co a curveball to this whole discussion. I mean, we look at pediatric TB. I think there have been some studies that have shown that if children have um, children have been to ex who have been exposed to drug resistant TB, in fact, they sometimes have drug sensitive TB. So what do we do in such situations? Would we start an empiric therapy, which is what essentially we do in practice? We start empiric therapy based on their contact, which might be drug resistant TB, where the child in fact doesn't have drug sensitive TB. So I think in certain circumstances, it may be valid to maybe withhold some certain treatment until we get proper definitive testing. Um, considering that the medication is so toxic as well, you know? So I, th I think that's a really important point and, and I think with the progression that we're seeing in treatment alternatives for drug resistant TB, it might become more reasonable to go ahead and start with an empiric regimen for a child contact, especially a very young child contact of somebody with MDR or XDR TB. Um, and there's this additional issue obviously with diagnosis in children that you may never get a, a, a viable sample. Um, and I guess I, I would um, add that, uh, agreeing with Nasir, that if we are thinking about this, this universe that we can all hope for, in which there will be real-time um, point of care whole genome sequencing, so there would be results within a day or two, one could make the argument that in some cases it, empiric treatment, treatment needn't be started immediately. We're not there quite yet. Um, so I, I, th I think there are a few, few instances. Yeah, and I think that's a very important fact because we are, as Nazir has mentioned, we're speaking about a very ideal situation. And sitting as a patient advocate, I do realize that there's areas, certainly Eastern Europe, um, Eastern Europe, most certainly in South Africa and the more remote areas that people don't even have access to care. So we are talking about really advanced, you know, treatment programs and the ability to just access basic um, health care. Although I have to say, you know, I don't think we're ever going to get there if yeah. we continue to say, oh, we should aim for a universal regimen that doesn't require any DST, that if we think this is the best thing for people, then we need to make it happen as opposed to giving up and saying, well, Agreed. in these settings, they don't have basic health care, so let's not try to give them the best yeah, we no, have. And I yeah. think, you know, finding that balance mm -hmm. becomes important, but we have to stop trying uh, to have TB care be guided by the income level mm -hmm. or the, you know, the, the advancement of a health system. If we think it's right for people, it's right for people and we have to make it happen. Yes. So, Agreed. you know. And, yeah. and, and actually, if our panel, I'm not sure they can actually look up, we, but in fact, in, from our audience, actually, um, they, they felt that in, oh, do you have yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. something to see? I didn't see it there, <laughs> sorry, okay. I, my logistics are a little bit off here. So, in fact, the audience thinks that actually all, all people should be able to get an individualized care guided by a um, whole genome sequencing. And um, a smaller amount think that maybe just those who have a rapid resistance results. Okay. Um, I wanted to follow up one of, the, one of the comments, Carol, that you just made and Zadri, that you mentioned. And that's this issue of, you mentioned in children, sometimes we send all of the results off and nothing comes back. And this happens also in um, adult medicine. medicine sometimes and with our extra pulmonary TB. Um, what do we do in that instance? Or what do we do when we've done our due diligence and sent everything off? and nothing comes back. Nazir, I know that never happens in your laboratory. It, uh, it but always happens. But, <laughs> it's but, part of the nature of, of yes. diagnostics, right? But would, would, you, would anybody like to talk about that? What does that mean for an individualized regimen? Are we really just opting back to an empiric regimen? Yeah, so speaking as someone who spends a lot of time taking care of children with tuberculosis and particularly those with drug-resistant TB, um, we do try to do our due diligence and often we don't get a result back because they can't expectorate or, you know, something happens to the culture or the sample along the way. <laughs> This may not be laboratory-guided individualized treatment, but certainly we individualize the approach to treatment depending on the age, the closeness of the contact. A two-year-old who sleeps in bed with their mom who has MDRTB is very different 
than an 11-year-old um, who uh, is exposed more in the community. So we've been so frightened of this term individualized um, in the TB world. And Carol Mitnick and I were remembering a time almost 20 years ago where we sat in the audience while this debate was happening with some of our teachers and mentors. And I think we have to get over that. If we take into account things like exposure, things like epidemiologic risk, things like occupation, that already is individualized therapy. And this is what people deserve. They're not cookie cutters. We shouldn't treat them in that way. So I individualize treatment for my children that I work with based on risk factors. So even in the setting of non-bacteriologically confirmed disease. Um, and I think we have to be comfortable doing that. Lab tests help us, but we treat people, not test results. And we have to be more comfortable making some allowances for those things. So. And, and I think, Jennifer, that's a very important um, uh, point that you raise, because we are looking toward being more patient-centeredness. So you do need to individualize in, in whichever scenario it is, whether you have t um, treatment results or if you don't have treatment results coming back. It's about focusing on the patient and being holistic and ensuring that they get the care that they deserve. You know, and that's the move that we're trying to go towards. So individualized does not mean only guided by a laboratory result. Yeah, yeah that's, that's right. the that's the, the little take home message and, I and, heard. And, and I just want to point out that our laboratory expert was the one who mentioned taking a really good social history. Uh, <laughs> yes. Well, let, well, let's stay for a moment on that issue of laboratories because what are we going to have to do to be able to get to that universal access to whole genome sequencing. Um, Jennifer mentioned political will. I hope, I think on this stage we all have that, but what are the other logistical steps? Yeah, so I think the, the one thing, obviously the, the cost around applying these technologies in resource limited countries, so the infrastructure to buy these big sequences can be quite expensive, and often the cost per test in terms of library preparation is quite expensive. But I think the prices are coming down. The unfortunate thing is that Although prices are coming down in dollar terms, uh, developing countries' uh, currencies are weakening against the dollar. <laughs> so the price reduction doesn't make much of a huge difference for when it comes to that. But I, I think overall, I mean, the, the prices are declining, and I think we will get there. And there's an emerging mar comp competitive market currently emerging. I think that will sort itself out in terms of cost. The biggest issue for me would be around uh, the validation of the technology and its interpretation. So. You know, in the past, we just had the RPOB hotspot region for, G for rifampicin. We knew it very well. It was just 81 base pairs, and that's it. Now we're dealing with 4 million base pairs. Um, so there's been, uh, like, the cryptic consortium and a few other groups that are working together to build a much larger database. Because the biggest problem that you have is that for the common mutations, I think we can, even the line probes, et cetera, we can predict off those strips, and we can, we'll know it's a high confidence resistance mutation or not. Uh, but as we find the rarer um, mutations, less common ones, the only way we can really address the meaning of those is around doing large databases that are global. Because if we have three strains in South Africa that have a specific mutation, India has two, uh, in total we can, we can take away the noise and say, look, nine out of ten times it's S or R. Um, so I think that's uh, one important thing. And the other issue is, again, as we're looking at the four million bases, our knowledge is fairly limited. So. There's emerging evidence around, you know, we always assume that mutation equals resistance. Well, that's what I was going to ask you, so I'm glad you brought that up. So, so, so that's not totally true. So some mutations are not, they more variants and might be associated with the lineage, like Beijing in, in the Jair A um, gene is a Beijing marker. Uh, so that's one thing, so we shouldn't be calling any mutation resistance. Uh, the other issue is, I mean, what's slowly emerging is that some mutations can cause hypersusceptibility. Now, that's bizarre, right? So, <laughs> so, so you know, the, the whole issue of this landscape is fairly new. And that's, that's why I said that it's important that we need to do, have these large databases, number one, and have a lot more clinical validation of the, this information. So while 80, 90 percent of the mutations that we know of uh, confer high, high levels of resistance, that's fairly easy to interpret, but when you come to the rarer ones, uh, this is where I think a lot more science needs to grow. I just, I just want to make two comments. Again, yeah, I think, Nasir, you made a really interesting point that I want to highlight, which is that you think that the, the cost issue will sort itself out. And, and, I, and I, 
I have to, again, this, com this comes to the political will point and it comes to the creative approaches. It seems to me, and I know very little about whole genome sequencing, but um, that right now the model for reducing cost is just increasing throughput, that it's higher throughput settings where cost has come down. And so clearly that's not going to serve a point of care um, you know, immediate, immediate response sort of situation. And so I think there are probably do need to be some innovations to thinking about a different model for reducing costs than just, than just high throughput. Yeah, so, so I mean, uh, there's another session, I think at two o'clock where I'm presenting and uh, sort of looking at alternative approaches. Uh, I know people want this point of care and it's a holy grail for everyone, but we don't even have a point of care for TB diagnosis, right? Uh, so I think, you know, it's like uh, the topic of my talk will be later is, uh, you know, solutions here and now. So although we want this holy grail of a point of care, but can't we do something now? And if it means that we do a centralized solution that has some optimization, yeah. uh, and the reality is for drug-related uh, drug TB or TB for that matter, it's at least a six months journey, right? Uh, patients would be started on some treatment and asked to come back after two weeks. So even if you have a result 24 hours later, you know, you might get the person to come back earlier, then they're going to come back at 14 days and then at 28 days and then monthly thereafter. So I think the, the, the hit hard, hit early, and then the time lapse, uh, we still have some gap. Ideally, we'd like to have it the same day or the next day, uh, but I think we also need to look at what's, uh, what we can do right now. Right, and I, I, would, never, I would never disagree with yeah. that point that there are yeah. things that we could be optimizing the use of now. Yeah. I, I think that just the one other comment I wanted to make is I, you did a nice job of describing some of the sources of uncertainty when we do when, when we do actually have these results and talking about how international collaborations and increasing um, our ability to infer from big data will, will be helpful. But there will still be an inherent uncertainty in these results. And I guess to me it's analogous to the same points we were just making, that it's a matter of using all of the information and individualizing to that information and making the, when in doubt, going with a stronger regimen rather than a weaker regimen. I, I think the principles still, still hold even with the uncertainty when we get down to that um, genomic level. And can I just ask one thing? Because I actually, I get mixed up about this a lot. Could you tell me, will whole genome sequencing replace our phenotypic labs, or how are these going to complement each other? Okay, so. Okay. <laughs> that's a great question. So I think, you know, if you look at, for example, for rifampicin, by and large, we're kind of far more confident in the genomic data than we are in the phenotypic data, especially for midget. We know it misses some uh, resistance as such. So I think. It, it's drug by drug, right? So if you look at the new drugs, for example, bazaquilin or uh, delaminate, we have this whole plethora of possibilities of gene genetic targets. But we don't really, we need the phenotype to really give us an understanding of, you know what, we find, uh, I mean, there's been great, great excitement around um, bazaquilin genetic targets. Uh, but they just create a lot of noise because you end up with these variants that are way below the breakpoint of wild type strains. So I think it's drug by drug. So ideally, the more solid we have, uh, 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 the larger our database is in terms of being able to interpret um, the genomic data using phenotype, we could replace two molecular tests. Because I think phenotypic tests are generally slow. And that's the honest truth. It doesn't really have the clinical impact we need. Molecular tests do achieve that. But it's sort of like using the phenotype and then developing predictors for genetics to to interpret. Well, we've talked a little bit about the fact that, or, or much of our discussion so far about an individualized regimen has been about picking the regimen. But let's just go one step deeper. Does anyone want to talk about individualized dosing? Possibly the role of therapeutic drug monitoring? Is this going to become universal? Yes. Yeah, so, so um, I, I, go, oh, please, Tato, no, go ahead. I was saying we hope so. <laughs> That's the aim that we're hoping so, considering um, the levels of toxicity and some of the new drugs that have arrived, and we don't really, you know, we're still trying to figure out these doses. So I think that really should be the path that we're going for universally, you know? 
Yeah, and I think not just the toxicity of the new drugs, I actually think the toxicity of the old drugs. drugs. Well. Yes. Um, you know, one of the great uh, sorrows of my medical career is the large number of patients that I made deaf uh, through the use of injectable agents. Um, and again, there was this idea that somehow we have to make it simple so everyone gets the same weight-based dosing, everybody gets the same length of treatment, everybody gets the same medications, and it has resulted in a significant amount of harm. Uh, and I would suggest he was one of the reasons why um, TB is uh, once again the leading infectious killer of adults worldwide. And we can't be blind to this. We can't be blind to this. Now, uh, there are some patients who metabolize medications differently than others. Um, there are some patients who may have other risk factors for the development of adverse events. Um, and we need to take these things into account as we work to provide all of them uh, with an optimal treatment regimen. Now, one of the things, um, as someone who's engaged in this debate for quite some time, that we're often accused of is, you know, you guys are dreaming big and you think the world has unlimited resources, so be more, pra be more practical. Um, and I think we've had a failure of ambition. Yes, it takes resources to do these, but if we don't acknowledge the truth of where we've gotten with a standard one-size-fits-all approach, we can't advance the field of science. So it's exciting to talk about ways we can reduce toxicity and increase efficacy for individualized patients. And if therapeutic drug monitoring seems too far away or too expensive, we have to fight to make it cheaper. You know, when we're talking about the cost of whole genome sequencing, yes, some of it's based on throughput, but some of it is based on price gouging. Um, and this is again where I look around the room and I see many colleagues who've worked very hard to show us that costs are not fixed and they don't have to be fixed. So how do we bring down the costs with advocacy, with honesty, with you know, saying we don't want a universal regimen. What we want is better care for every individual with this disease. So to me, it's not just a matter of thinking about people-centered care, it's the whole paradigm with how we've approached TB has led us into a situation um, where we haven't made the progress that we've wanted. So I think the more that we are able to give people care that will improve their outcomes uh, and minimize their risk of having toxicity, this should be our goal. Just to come in there, I think, you know, what you've mentioned is so true. Even for the first-line drug, like RIF and INH, I mean, the, the whole issue of, I mean, if you look at the fast and slow acetylators for INH, uh, there's like a 30, 40% 30, difference geographically, right? Um, and we're just willing to accept that 30% will get low or high doses or whatever it is. And that really is, I mean, for, for drugs that are workhorses for decades, uh, that have adverse events and also lead to uh, loss to follow-up, et cetera, because of adverse events, we really need to do better. I mean, there's uh, genetic targets like NET2 that kind of predict these types of uh, genomic variations and can help tailor, tailor these regimens. Uh, and I, to be honest, I think we, we really need to up our game when it comes to dosaging. Mm -hmm. uh, even for Rifampus, and I was quite surprised. I mean, we actually underdose, right, uh, severely. Uh, and the tolerability levels are far higher. So, I mean, we should be aiming to sterilize patients and cure them rapidly. Uh, but we're just giving sort of substandard dosages. And we've never really known what the doses in children should be. We've really just said, oh, little people, okay, we'll do the same <laughs> type of thing there, okay. Um, so ironically, the little people sometimes need higher doses yeah. because their metabolism <laughs> is uh, much more ramped up. Yeah. So in fact, in, in some ways, I feel like the panel is talking th about this future of we know as much as we can about the bug, and maybe we'll be needing to know as much as we can about the patient to truly match dosing, length of regimen, what should be in the regimen. Well, I, I put another, the next set of questions up here, and they've been up there for a bit, so let's see if we have some answers there. Ah. <laughs> much more of an answer skew here. So um, I, I think that we're going to be bringing you in here a little bit more. Um, patient provider discussion around individualized treatment is necessary for patient-centered care. Which of the following is the primary batter, barrier to initiation of this pra best practice? So. Uh, are we leading our patients to be confused by giving them more information 
that seems to be one concern. Um, it certainly takes longer to explain things to patients. It looks like that's another concern. Uh, ooh, mm. this one makes me wince a little bit. Perceived reduction of the provider's authority. Ooh, that seems to like make me want to run off the podium um, <laughs> because it uh, doesn't sound good. And then many other reasons. Um, would the panel like to tackle this question? <laughs> I think I'll take this one. <laughs> it's very interesting because before I came to the panel discussion, I've spoken with a few colleagues and other advocates about what they think about individualized um, patient treatment. And I had the most varied response ever. <laughs> so I'm not surprised to see the results that we have in, on the board. Um, I can speak from a personal perspective and I'll tell you why from a personal perspective and why I also think that we need more than just my personal perspective. You know, so my care essentially was very individualized. My, my, um, my, my doctor knew that I was a doctor and were able to talk about medication. We probably had very long sessions, you know, longer than other patients because I was able to understand and grasp the information. And I think that gave me a, re a really meaningful um, process in terms of my journey and my treatment process. But certainly other patients don't get that. And the biggest frustration and the biggest dissatisfaction that I've heard from other um, pe and people who have had TB is that they don't get information. They are not told what the treatment is, what the, obviously not everywhere. I mean, like in a certain, definitely in South Africa where there's high burden and um, we really don't have time. Physicians don't have time to speak to patients. Patients don't get any information and it's left to the actual doctor or the clinician to make a decision on what they're gonna get. So, um, there's lots of issues of that. I, I personally believe there should be shared decision making. It's a whole science where the, the service provider or the clinician, be it a doctor or a nurse, and um, the patient actually come together and discuss what the condition is, in this instance being tuberculosis, discuss the different treatment regimens that are available, and we know there's varied treatment regimens across the world, um, discuss the potential side effects of the different medications, and have a discussion. It's, there's, no, there's no right answer in shared decision making, essentially. Every individual is different. My answer to individual, individualized patient care would be very different from the next person. And you know, from just from speaking from the other advocates and other doctors who, um, who've had this discussion with me, we came to a very different conclusion on which regimens we would want based on what we know about the, um, about the medications, based on past experiences of treating patients, based on our own personal preferences and beliefs. So I think it's more about the decision-making space and allowing the patient to be involved in those decisions, understanding um, the medications and so on. And yes, it, it takes time. It's just something that we have to understand that TB is very complicated. The medications are still more complicated. I learn something new every day about tuberculosis. I've certainly learned a whole bunch of new things since being to the conference. So it's about the physician understanding that they have an obligation to help the patient understand what's going on with them because they have a right to make decisions about their bodies. Yeah. I think that that's a, a very helpful answer. I, the only thing I wanna add to that is I think there's a perception that there would be a net loss of time mm -hmm. for, the, for the clinician, for the health system to have this discussion. And I don't think we actually have evidence to support that, right? Because there may be all kinds of collateral benefits to having had that shared decision making, to having had that relationship developed um, and, and what that allows for the patient's whole experience with treatment. So it actually could be a huge net savings for the health systems. We, we, we don't know, but the assumption is that that individual, that, that, that single interaction is a cost. And maybe if I could add, I mean, there's other modes of actually ensuring that a patient is informed and educated. There's been very good examples of patient support groups. The patients can speak to each other, and that's where they get the information. So allow, um, you know, as a physician, I think it's also the responsibility um, on you to direct the patient in the right spaces and the right people where they can find more information and get more clarity on what, what decision they should be taking. Yeah. And using also um, patient, uh, uh, small things like patient information leaflets. You'd be surprised that you don't get those incentives. You know, um, I was fortunate where I was treated, there were very 
well established, I had all the information that I needed, but you know, you once you start traveling around South Africa and maybe in other p uh, parts of the world, then you find that patients don't have a simple thing like a little piece of paper that explains to them what tuberculosis is, which is a serious problem. You know. uh, it, it is a very serious problem and it's an area where we have um, not done enough. Um, you know, I think Carol, your point is excellent that we assume that spending, you know, 20 to 30 minutes to discuss um, a, a treatment decision is going to hurt us in terms of time. And many people are very busy. We work in clinics where there are 30, 40 people waiting to be seen. But if that person doesn't have the information and decide they don't want to take treatment anymore, then you spend days looking for them. You know, it, it, it is this idea. But some of it is a little bit darker than that. And Jane, I know you said you kind of want to get off the stage. But I've heard providers say two things. One is, um, if we let people who are receiving treatment for drug-resistant TB know about the side effects and the lack of uncertainty, they won't take treatment. And I was working in Eswatini um, and had some time to spend on the wards with some people who were being treated. And one gentleman said to me, do you guys think we're not going to find out? Right. It, it's, it's our bodies. And when we don't answer those questions for people, People look for answers to those in other places. And, and then this sense that, you know, there are areas of uncertainty. And how do we convey uncertainty to people when we want them to do what we say? Um, but, but there's been a lot of work done in the United States, which is a very litigious society when it comes to medicine, that the biggest reason physicians are sued is not because they make mistakes. It's because they don't communicate with people. And so I try to have frank conversations with the people who've come to me seeking care where I say, you know, I don't honestly know the answer to this question, um, but I'd like to share with you what I know. I'd like to hear from you, you know, where your preferences lie and we can make a decision about this together because it is a partnership whether or not we acknowledge it. So, yeah. And I think honesty f builds trust and the trust is what builds confidence. Yes. Very much what you said. You look like you wanted to jump back in there a moment, no? Yeah, I was going to talk about the honesty. It's just being frank with people. I think there's a tendency to think that um, people who have been uh, infected with TB don't understand, or they're not smart, or they're not clever. But it's, it's another human who's sitting in front of you. Just have a conversation like any other person and be honest and open yeah. about it. And I have to say, I do like to think um, good of people, that it's not just time or whatever. But I think that it's probably good for us as physicians to understand what we don't know, that we actually don't have the answers, and that we need as many people, and certainly the patient, in deciding what the best best issue is. Yeah, and some of this discussion has simply been squelched by an over-reliance on things like directly observed therapy, right? So rather than engage in discussions um, with people, we've said, we so fundamentally mistrust you that you have to come to the clinic every day to pick up your medicine and we can watch you swallow. And this has been very damaging. It shouldn't be a pillar of how we approach tuberculosis. It should be something that we recognize as potentially very damaging and difficult for people who are living with the disease and, and stop insisting about it. First of all, nobody does it. You know, even though there's 100% DOT coverage, supposedly, most people don't get DOT. And it places a tremendous burden on people who are sick who then have to make the effort to go to clinic every day. And I think people living with TB show far greater uh, commitment to therapy because they have to do this. And so, but, but because we fall back on these antiquated ideas about how we should approach TB, we haven't been able to have these discussions and it's been very damaging. So it's so refreshing to have this conversation. Yeah. And you know, so much, I think we've totally lost sight on the fact that DOT was part of case management. It wasn't supposed to be the standalone pillar yeah. at all. And, and in the original DOTS, re, uh, dots you know, um, strategy, it really wasn't even within the whole length of therapy. It was for the intensive phase and really to help with that case management. Yeah, and, and the ability to adhere changes over time, right. right? Someone, we talk about patients as being adherent or non-adherent, but some really interesting work by Amita Daftari looking at people who are living with HIV and MDRTB found they were very adherent to their antiretroviral therapy. Um, and then the ability to be adherent may change. If my husband is my main support person and he dies, 
I may lose my ability to be adherent. And so these concepts of, you know, it's a fixed time and it should be the same for everyone. We also have to individualize our approaches to adherence, but that requires compassion and openness and some humility uh, on the parts of all of us. Now, do you think the states, stakes are ratcheted up when we have these same conversations around um, very vulnerable populations, such as children, or someone who can't decide for themselves. Is that a more difficult conversation or is that the same con type of conversation about creating the, you know, the discussion of these uncertainties, how to pick regimens? Any thoughts? I think that's quite a difficult one. I don't have mu too much experience with pediatric TB, but I would imagine that the ideas are there, but it's probably the more pressing issues is how do we diagnose the tuberculosis? Which regimen are we gonna go on? It doesn't really, I don't feel it's steered towards individualized care, essentially, but the same issues would come up inherently because it's the same problem. And I think we often use this term vulnerable population, again, as sort of a static state. So why are people considered vulnerable? vulnerable. And it's usually because they don't have the same freedom of choices. Um, the, if they're a migrant and they don't do what the doctor says, they may face certain risks that make this conversation much more important to have, but much more difficult. Children, we just assume they don't understand and we don't want to upset them. Kids know when they're sick, you know, and, and you don't, go to them and say, you have MDR and you may die and you have to take 12 medicines, but you gauge where they are in terms of what they want to know uh, and you provide them with that information. Um, caregivers of children with TB may have a severe amount of guilt um, often put on them by the medical system. You infected your child. You made your child sick. And so the parents may not be able to participate. And we have to be aware of all of those things when we engage with people. One, uh, just one announcement I wanted to let people know. This, schedule, this session was supposed to be scheduled from 12.10 to 1.10. We started a little bit late because of the uh, last session running over. Um, none of the afternoon sessions now start till 2. So as long as there is discussion going on, we're going to continue for about 10 minutes past our usual, um, our scheduled time. So if you're starting to look at your watches, I just wanted you to say relax a minute. Um, the other thing is we wanted to see what people had in terms of questions from the audience about individualized care. Now I know that I learned all about this vote and ask app, but you know, I realized I forgot to ask a fundamental question. I told everyone how to ask, but I don't know how, where, the, where the questions go to. Do they go to the, where do they go? There's a microphone. But anyway, let's go, you know what? I, I always joke that I'm a low-tech TB person. There's a microphone in the center. So come on up and if you feel, feel free to ask some questions for the rest of our panel. Yes, now. I have more questions that we've written, but we'd like to hear your questions. Um, hi everyone, I'm Sia from South Africa. Um, in South Africa, we have the National Adherence Strategy, um, which looks at um, individualized care for patients, either on HIV or also on TB MDR. But the biggest question is, we do have individualized plan for adherence for every patient, but they never get filled in. Nobody ever even consider to do that. And when we advocate in meetings where we meet as clinicians, the question is whose responsibility it is to, to actually take the time, fill in the individualized, because I love the, the comment that says DOT is not the strategy to look at patient outcomes and adhering to treatment. For me, even if we can introduce a video dot, I still feel we're sending a message to patient that we don't trust you, you are a criminal, we need you to finish your treatment. It doesn't talk about psychosocial support, it doesn't talk about the barriers to treatment, but the question is whose responsibility it is to make sure that the individualized plan are filled in and they are followed in each and every visit. Would, would anyone like to take some of, the, some of that? I actually think it's a joint responsibility. Yeah. And I think oftentimes, I speak as a clinician, um, 
you know, we feel a little overwhelmed in our ability to talk about or address some of these issues, so we don't. But then we also tend to say the counselors will take care of that, or the social worker will take care of that. And we abdicate our responsibility around that. All of us need to be involved in adherence planning. And in fact, it's probably the most important thing we can do. We talk a lot about new drugs and new regimens. It's so much better than the old regimen. Most patients won't have received an old regimen and a new regimen. And nine months is still a long time. And six or seven drugs, even if they're better drugs, are still a lot of drugs to take. So we all have to say, what's my responsibility? And not say the social worker should deal with issues around adherence. The counselors should. We all have to take responsibility for that. Um, and when it isn't done, it's all of our fault, is what I would say. Um, yeah. I have to say, the, the, you know, the, you, I've been pra practicing TB care now for a few decades. And I, I think if we go back to one of the TB statements in the United States two or three times ago, I have to tell you as a young TB doctor, I really took it to heart. There is this one sentence in the preamble and it says that completion of therapy for tuberculosis is the responsibility of the pr pr provider, not the patient. And it's really sort of flipped things for me because as a pulmonologist, if I have an asthma patient and they aren't taking their asthma medicines, it's, it, I've always felt that it is much more of their responsibility, a little bit tipped that way. So I agree with you, Jennifer, it's all of our responsibilities and just because though we have a bigger team doesn't dilute out our responsibilities. It looked like maybe you were holding your... No, I was gonna talk about the importance of, you know, we speak about being multidisciplinary it's not just one person who's treating the patient. There's a whole group of people who are involved in the care of pe treating somebody with um, in, in TB, including the patient, right? Yeah. But the importance, again, is communicating that with somebody who's taking treatment and helping them understand, you know, as much as the physician has rights and responsibilities, the patient also has the rights and responsibilities, but it's a shared responsibility at the end. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm going to joke a minute. We talk so much about uh, language and TB control. Yeah. I like to call it multi complementary <laughs> team rather than multidisciplinary. <laughs> but anyway, next question. Um, so I was going to make a similar point to my colleague here, so I'll try not to repeat that. But I was also really pleased to hear that powerful point you made, Jennifer, about sort of reevaluating how we're using DOT. Um, and recognizing that patients often don't take the medication for very valid reasons. And perhaps in terms of individualizing adherent strategies, it's about exploring with them what their main barriers are going to be to missing certain doses of the medication and how that's going to display itself within their, say, six months treatment regimen. So are they going to struggle at particular time points during that regimen? Are they more likely to stop their medication entirely or just skip doses here and there? And then building our individualized um, approaches to non-adherence on that basis or a solid evidence base of how they're going to miss doses and where they're going to struggle. So uh, yeah, I guess I'd add something into the title. Individualized treatment involves an individualized non-adherence support as well. I think you get no, uh, no pushback on that from this group. <laughs> Hi, I'm Anya from Medicine Sons Frontiers in Kailicha. And I, th I think a lot of us in the room agree that patient-centered care and individualized care is definitely the way that we need to go. But I know working in the field, this is definitely, we're very far from this reality due to a number of factors, work pressures, time, et cetera. So I guess or, my question- Or national policies. Or national people. policies. <laughs> so I guess my question is around indicators and how to make sure that this is happening because we know that currently TB indicators don't include measures of patient support. They don't include measures of whether people are individualizing therapy. And at the clinic level, a lot of clinicians have to work towards targets, and the targets involve number of patients seen, not care given, patient support, individualized care. So my question to the panel is, should we be thinking about indicators, and what kind of indicators could be reflecting this approach that we want to take going forward? So Jen, Jen just thrust the micro microphone in my hand. Um, <laughs> I, I think that's it's it's a really excellent point because we we are were driven um, in this kind of public health 
environment by, by these indicators and by the indicators, they're, they're all derived from the original DOTS indicators. So while DOTS has evolved over time as a strategy and it has, you know, the, it has widened to include things like treatment for MDRTB, how novel, um, we haven't really adjusted the way we think about what, what success looks like. And, and I think you're, you're just, you're making excellent examples. And, and maybe, maybe the degree of individualization isn't really the right indicator either. It's whether people are getting the right treatment. And for maybe 70% of patients, maybe the empiric regimen is fine and it never needs to be changed and it's only 30% who, who need the right regimen. But, but maybe that's really one of the ways of looking at that individualized question. And then also, you know, the, the treatment support, there is a lot of movement in, in the US at least to be looking at some patient satisfaction um, indicators. And I think many people will say, well, in resource poor settings, we can't be concerned about that because we barely have enough staff to even see them. And that, that just doesn't make any sense. There's no point in providing poor quality care. So, so I think um, I, 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 it's not something I had thought about before, and I really appreciate the suggestion, and it's something that we could work together to come up with a set of indicators that would um, describe high-quality, patient-centered care for, for MDR. Can I maybe add to that? I had the fortune um, of attending a quality conference about I think it was two, uh, two weeks ago. And the issue of quality actually came up and one of the presentations was made on the quality of care and how patients rate it. So there certainly is space to, you know, to have patient developed indicators that could assess the quality of care that they uh, approve. I don't think it's really translated into tr um, t um, treatment of TB, but it certainly is there and we're able to do that. One of the presentations was actually done in a developing nation, so the, the whole argument of having high burdens and not having people to look at quality is really, it's moot, yeah. yeah. No, Just I, a, yeah. a comment as well, I think the, the point around quality of care and health systems are probably at the core of most of the issues, right? If you look at even the expert implementation, often the underlying fact is not really around the technology, but the system in which the technology is deployed. So we've had challenges with experts, and although the technology works well, the whole health system needs to accommodate that change. And part of it also how the health system accommodates the needs of people, right? So like after our services, weekend services, a lot of people are working. We haven't really adapted our services to that level of individualization. And I think that even like we're talking of whole genome sequencing, but for me, it's like even with experts, we, we have such a high loss to follow up. We have other issues. Uh, so it's not the technology per se, but it's the um, uh, plugging in the holes around that system as well. Great. Other comments? No? Any other questions from the audience? Oh, good. I, I'm always worried whether someone's getting up to leave or getting up to go to the go to the uh, mic. Thank you. Um, I have a comment. Sorry, Catherine Berry, uh, MSF. Um, uh, I have a comment and a question. First of all, I think just to you know really reinforce the need to partner with patients in taking um, you know combined responsibility for treatment. I think the other side of that is that like. The, even with the newer drugs, the toxicities associated with those drugs us remain you know, highly significant. Peripheral neuropathy, optic neuropathy, and it's so key that patients are involved in uh, being aware of all of that going in so um, they can tell you quickly when those symptoms are evolving. I don't, I don't think we've got fully evolved tools to really um, pick up those subclinical and early adverse events in, in a lot of our patients. So feel free to comment on that. Um, the second is more a question for you all is um, behind this, you know, we, if we agree that there needs to be individualised treatment here, um, do we have all the tools in place to support NTPs um, with bring this to life? So I, can, I agree with the, with the laboratory and all of the laboratory logistics um, but we have huge problems in just maintaining the cascade of care, getting people onto treatment, and um, you know we still see we still see stockouts and you know chain of custody problems that you know really make this difficult when we're still struggling with standardised treatments. 
You know, I, th I think it's a great point. Um, and <clears throat> many of us here, all of us on this panel and, and Jane, we've spent years of our lives working in the field and on the front lines. And we are not naive about the reality on the ground. Um, you know, but there's a potential that our system is causing some of those struggles. Do we have stockouts because we told countries they should only order TB drugs once a year and we've made it so challenging for them to do that and that you can't make any changes or adaptations because the global fund makes them buy their drugs in a certain, you know, did we create the mess that we're in? Um, and I think we've never been reflective enough about this. Um, and, and do we have to wait for that mess to be fixed in order to do some of these other things? And I would suggest, and, and I, I would love to hear from other panel members, that by you know, demanding that we stop having this inane discussion about individualized versus standardized care and say we need to provide the best services that we possibly can for everyone, we can start to answer some of those questions. Do the NTPs have the tools? They do not partly because we've been unwilling to ask the questions. Um, and, and it isn't a benign thing. It's a deliberate decision that's been made by people at this conference, by the donor community. You know, this, re this quest for a universal regimen dominated the TB science discussion. It dominates the funding landscape. And it, I don't think we'll ever get where we need to go in terms of making these tools available uh, if we continue to get stuck in these old ways of thinking, so. I think just to comment as well, I think Madhukar Pai gave a nice uh, presentation yesterday at the New Diagnostics Work Group. And it, what he highlighted was that, you know, I think in the TB community we're not um, vocal enough that we're given a pot and we know it's insufficient but we'll just try and break that pot up into pieces and try and do what we can with what we have. But that's not really the way that you need to do the deal with the issue. And I think that's one of the, one of the problems, something that you've highlighted. The second thing I think that's important, and I think we, we kind of underestimate TB in terms of what's required. I mean, even drug susceptible TB, like we spoke about the time that's required. And I think it, it's a complex disease. I mean, especially if you're dealing with HIV, the drug interactions, uh, you can't just, assume that a nurse will take the patient in, here's the lab result, dish out tablets, and goodbye. Because that's not how you, you need to manage a, a sort of a long-term disease. Uh, there's a lot more that needs to be done. I think our perception of how we deal with TB uh, needs to be taken to a different level of seriousness. And I think that's, that's what's required. I guess I just also want to reinforce one point that, that this discussion about individualized care, do, it does not mean that everybody is going to get a distinct regimen, a distinct model of treatment support, a you know, distinct package of services. That's not, to me, that's not what individualized means. It means that each person is going to get what is best for him or her. And I would venture to guess that for a large majority of TB patients in any given setting, there will be a, a standard that, that works. And so we're talking about being prepared to have alternatives for people in whom that, that single standard or that standard doesn't, doesn't work, and not by waiting to watch it fail, but by pre preemptively, proactively assessing what the needs are. And so while, while I acknowledge your point, Catherine, that I don't know where you are, <laughs> there you are. Well, that, that, um, that programs may not be fully prepared for, for that right now, and I completely agree with Jen and, and what Nazir was saying, and part of that is the lack of ambition, it's the lack of imagination, and, and you know, this notion that everything has to be done in a kind of utilitarian, the greatest good for the greatest number approach um, I, I, I don't think the gap is that huge from where, where we are and where we would need to be. It's, it's really a matter of committing to use resources differently, to distribute resources differently, and, and also, I think, to, to have different benchmarks for success, as you pointed out. I think we're going to have one last question from the floor. Hi, thanks very much. That was a really interesting discussion. I am curious how you see uh, 
the evolving role of international normative guidance, say WHO guidelines, or if you see a role for them in this move towards individualized, the much needed move towards individualized therapy uh, and monitoring and regimens and whatnot, because obviously those are generally work best in the context of standards. And so is it just about um, promoting that quality care is the standard or is there uh, another role you see you see for the, that type of guidance? Um, thank you. I think, I think it's a really interesting point. The, the WHO guidelines actually over the last decade or so have really, for, for the specific uh, uh, treatment, the composition of regimens, they really have been individualized according to an algorithm. And then the, you know, the, bungla, the, short, all, the shortened regimen has been added. Um, and so, so that, I, I think that foundation is there. The um, rest of what's around supportive treatment has certainly not, not addressed these issues in as great detail. There hasn't been the same attempt to do systematic reviews and, and um, individual patient data meta-analyses or other kinds to, to the same degree. There have been some um, on adherence and, and, and some other areas. Um, and so I do think there is a lot of work, again, for, for changing the framework to not just be the, about treatment as, as medicine, but treatment as a, as a whole package of care and, and what goes into um, developing uh, best practices. And I think this is another area where um, the WHO recommendations are fundamentally misunderstood in terms of their scope and their purpose. They are meant to suggest a minimum standard of care that should be followed. They are not meant to say, this is what you need to do in your country. But they're, they're used in that way, right? It's almost like, well, if the WHO guideline doesn't say we can do it, we can't do it. And the donors behave, you know, well, you're not following WHO guidelines. And so I think this idea, I think the WHO or somebody needs to set a minimum set of standards for how we should approach this. Otherwise, there's a risk right, that, that care could vary wildly. But the idea that somehow the WHO guidelines should be the be all and end all about how people are cared for, I, I don't think it's appropriate and it was never what they were meant to do. You know, I look Nazir and Tato at South Africa, for example, uh, which has done an excellent job saying, we have looked in our country and at our local context to see what makes sense here and we're going to do these things because it's right in our country. And South Africa has led the region Region, right? If you look at countries that are now using all oral shorter regimens, all oral regimens, the WHO is committed to ending injectable therapy for a majority of patients by March 24th of 2020 in the words of the Director General, Dr. Tedros himself. Now, this is a short period of time away and South Africa has been able to provide a model of leadership for countries in the region to embrace this. And I think we have to let people do that more. Um, and so it's been a wonderful to see how South Africa has taken that. But South Africa is a relatively wealthy country where there's a group of highly trained scientists in a national TB program that has said the voices of people who don't agree with us are important, the voices of the affected community are important, and I see that as much more of a natural model for how international normative standards should be set and applied. Okay. Well, um, I'll bring this um, session to a close. Um, I have to tell you, I was um, sitting here listening and thinking about the very first uh, union conference I ever went to. I'm not going to tell you how long ago it was, but it was quite a long time ago. And um, I still remember being shocked because I went to a large symposium and it turned out that the debate was whether MDR TB, Carol will remember this, whether MDR TB should be treated at all in low and middle income countries. And I find it incredible that within what I still think is a fairly short lifespan of doing TB care, that we actually have moved all the way to a discussion of how are we going to institute individualized care, best care practices for every patient everywhere. So thank you for joining us in that discussion today. The only other practical point I have to um, make is 
If you're a union member, please remember to go to your union um, uh, uh, login and vote for um, the two seats on the board of directors and for the resolutions at the general, for the general assembly. Um, this is your right as a member to um, pick your leadership and I'm trying to encourage democracy and voting, so please get out there and vote. If you aren't a member, think about becoming a member so that you can have that voice. And thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you the pan great panel. Thank you.